know one another. My name's David, and uh, minister here at, at Woodis, um, or part of the team anyway. And, um, thanks for joining us for worship today. I want to give a shout out to a few people. Um, my friend Mark is playing the drums, is um, heading up our New Wine Discipleship Year, where um, both in this church and in the region, there are going to be 13 young people giving a year in kind of Christian discipleship and service, and eight of them based here, and two of them here right now. And Izzy and Heather, Heather's from Southampton, Izzy's from Penarth, Cardiff, they're here today. Should we give them a round of applause? And um, yeah, from time to time, you know, we, we've got Cornishmen in the house today. Cornish people. If you're from Cornwall, give a little grunt. There we are. I, I may have referenced my friend David and, and Joy from Camelford, and they're, they're here today. Just a little wave, guys. So, so David leads um, a church in Camelford, and we were at school together when we were four or five, something like that. So uh, great to have you here in the building today. Welcome. Um, now, I have lost a tooth. See that? Someone said to me today, the tooth will set you free. But I said to them, <laughs> fangs be to God. And I, I, I don't know whether it improves my appearance. But I do know this, that when I went to buy a fridge on Friday, and I smiled at the woman who was selling it at me, she immediately gave me 40 quid off. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. So um, I'm thinking of leaving it like that. <laughs> anyway. Gold, so I'm sure the Holy Spirit's involved there somewhere. But, um, or the dentist, one of the two. Anyway, but where we are, I, I want to talk today about prophetic confrontation. We started a series in Jeremiah. Last week, I was talking about Jeremiah's call. We looked at the political situation of Judah in that time when there was this superpower in the south of Egypt and the superpower in the north and how the, the, in, in Jeremiah's time people were making alliances and political machinations and, um, and actually they were losing their focus spiritually and politically and how, how trouble came upon them and, and how Jeremiah spoke into all that over 40 years. And we, we looked at the way that Jeremiah was called as a very young man. He said, I'm only a child, I can't speak. And how God spoke to him through what he saw prophetically, this vision of an almond tree. And, and almond sounds like the word for watching. And, and God said, I'm watching to see my word fulfilled. And we, we thought about how we have a call, individually and corporately. And the fact that when we call on the Lord, when we, we seek for God, it's because he's already been seeking us. And his grace has called us and, and that we need to know what our call is. And, and not to say it's too hard for me because it always is too hard. But to learn what it is to lean into the work of the Holy Spirit so that we can do the things that God's called us to in his power, not in our own power. So, and today we're thinking about prophetic confrontation. And I want to suggest to you that we're not very comfortable with the idea of, of prophetic words being confrontative or challenging. But you, you know, just maybe wave, if you agree with that statement, that you're not very comfortable with, with it like that. Okay. I just want to unpack why that might be so. First of all, we may have experienced prophetic abuse, where people have basically told us off or told the church off in the name of the Lord, but really they were just venting, and, they're getting, and it's just not felt great to be part of it. Is that right? Okay, I've, I've certainly been there. Um, second thing, we believe actually in grace and mercy, don't we? And we, we kind of expect that God's words to us are going to be gracious words and merciful words. And in fact, we often quote a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, chapter 14, verse 3 rather, which says, all prophecy is for edification, encouragement, and comfort. And so we think, oh, well, the guideline in the New Testament then is that when we bring prophetic words, it's, it's to encourage people. Now, here at Woodlands, one of our practices is that once a month we run a prophetic clinic and we invite people to come. And there's a group of people who uh, have been trained and, and give themselves that ministry and they kind of listen to God. And you, you can come and, and, and ask, is God saying anything? But one of the protocols in that group is we want those words to be encouraging and upbuilding. You know, not to be sharing heavy things and warnings, all that kind of stuff. So that's been a bit of our practice. But also it may be that we're not quite sure where the authority to confront comes from. Can I really say that? Do you, do you, is, is that fair? So that, that's a bit of a background to our practice, if you like. But the reality is that when we look at the Bible, 
the default very often for prophets is confrontation and warning. There all the time. So if you, if you look at the Old Testament, the prophets are always warning the people of God, challenging them. And we, we, some of them are people like Ezekiel, who kind of, um, not Ezekiel, I think of Elijah, who, who kind of challenges the king. Or it might be, again, the prophet Nathan, who challenges King David when King David has fallen into sin and, and he kind of speaks a, a word that says, you're the man. You know? Or it might be um, in, in the New Testament that Jesus himself speaks prophetically in challenges. And, and the last week of Jesus' life, when, when he's in Jerusalem, he's always confronting and challenging people and upsetting them. And when we look at the New Testament, when we, we see people like Agabus, well, there are warnings that come. You know, there's going to be a famine. But when we see Paul or Peter, sometimes they, they say very specific words of knowledge stuff. Elemus, you're a son of the devil. You're going to be blind for a while. I mean, that's, that's not an encouraging, upbuilding word, is it? You know? So, in fact, the, the, I would say the prophetic warning and challenge is the dominant view that we see in the Bible. So, so why don't we see more of that? So let, what can we learn from, from the book of Je- Jeremiah about how to bring prophetic confrontation? And I'm going to read a couple of, um, of passages, Jeremiah in action. First one, the, the story of the linen belt. And Remember, Jeremiah is a prophet, and one of the words for a prophet is a seer, someone who sees things. And the, the prophets, they saw things in visionary form, but also God spoke to them through the things that they saw in the natural and material world. And I think that's very true today, actually, that the gift of prophecy, one way in which prophecy can, can, come, it can come through dreams, it can come through the prophetic imagination, it can come through visions that are really... Um, an open vision that, that is just in front of your physical eyes and they can come um, through God speaking to you through what you see in the material world so there's, there's somebody here who from time to time will go for a walk and see something and it'll get them thinking and then they'll come and, and, and feel that maybe God's speaking through that and they'll drop me a little email about it and for me to, to, to consider and here Jeremiah sees things. In fact, God directs him at what to look at. The first story is of the linen belt. And it says, go buy a linen belt, God says, and put it around your waist, but don't let it touch water. So I bought a belt, as the Lord directed, and put it around my waist. And then the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the belt you bought and are wearing around your waist and go now to Parath and hide it there in a crevice in the rocks. So I went and hid it in Parath as the Lord told me. And many days later, the Lord said to me, go now to Perath and get the belt I told you to hide them. So I went to Perath and dug at the belt and took it from the place where I'd hidden it, and now it's ruined and completely useless. And the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord says, in the same way, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. These wicked people who refuse to listen to my words who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and go after other gods to serve and worship them will be like this belt completely useless. For as a belt is bound round a man's waist, so I bound the whole house of Israel, the whole house of Judah to me, declares the Lord, to be my people for my renown and praise and honour, but they have not listened. One of Jeremiah's callings as somebody who watches and sees is that he sees what will happen. He sees, if you like, the law of cause and effect. And there is a law of cause and effect in the world. There are things that naturally follow as consequences from what we do. And and what Jeremiah sees as he looks at the nation of Israel is that he sees the consequences of pursuing other gods and other powers. For the the people of Judah, the pursuit of the other gods is like the the nations they want to make alliances with. and, And the whole pathway of putting their hope in something other than God is going to end in tears and disaster. And, and it's a law of cause and effect. And, and that kind of word, what do we do with something like that when we notice something? Here's a, another passage in Jeremiah 18. And this time, God directs Jeremiah to the potter's house. And this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to, to the potter's house, and 
I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation, I warned, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and it does evil in my sight and doesn't obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do from it. Then I therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, look, I'm preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. What we see brings a warning, but it's designed to turn people back to God. Um, Some years ago, I may have mentioned um, Clifford Hill. And Clifford Hill, someone I knew when I was younger, who had a kind of a prophetic ministry, which was linked with his occupation, actually, as a sociologist, looking at things in the nation. And and, um, he described at one time being on holiday in Austria, watching a a skiing contest. And he felt the Lord tell him to go back to his hotel by a different way from the way he travelled there. So he went back a different way. And just ahead of them, a commotion broke out. And um, it was on a very narrow footpath on the side of a snowy slope that led to a, a, a steep precipice. And as he looked, a child was rolling down that snowy slope. And a man rushed out of the crowd and was plowing through the snow, kicking up great fountains of snow behind him as he tried to overtake the falling child. And the man actually managed to reach the child and save the child from falling over the precipice. And then gingerly and carefully making his way back up the dangerous slope as people in the crowd lowered ropes to bring him up. It turned out that this man was the child's father. The child had slipped on the footpath and started to fall and he'd run after him at the risk of his own life to try and save his child. And God spoke to Clifford through what he saw. And he, he, he said, he actually wrote a book called Tell My People I Love Them. The message was, like this father loves this child, so I love you. And I see you going towards a precipice. I see you going towards a disaster. And I want to rescue you. And, I, and you need to turn back to me. And it's that sort of word, from that sort of vision and picture, that this story of the potter is. It's, it's a word that comes to bring warning to change hearts. For us, when we bring prophetic confrontation, when we hear about it, We worry that it will be judgmental. But confrontation is not the same as judgment. Judgment is passing a fixed sentence. And judgment is saying, is standing at a distance and saying, this is the consequences of your action, this is what's going to happen to you. But a prophetic word of warning and confrontation isn't a word of judgment. Many times it's a word of identification. Jeremiah identifies with the people of God. And the reason he brings words is not because God is wanting to punish, but because God is wanting to rescue. And the point of warning is to allow people to repent, to turn, and to be restored. You're familiar with the story of Jonah. And in in the Old Testament there, the story of Jonah is an amazing story about the mercy of God. Because Jonah is a prophet who's sent to bring a word of warning and judgment to the whole city of Nineveh. And Nineveh stands for the worst evil in the worst place on the planet at that time. And Jeremiah doesn't want to go, partly because he's scared, but actually he doesn't want them to repent because he'd like them to be destroyed, really. And, and when he finally goes there and, and speaks the word, and you know, God is going to destroy the great city of Nineveh, the whole city repents. And, and, and Jeremiah is, uh, sorry, Jonah is really annoyed, says to God, I know what you're like, you're full of mercy. You, you, oh. And... Um, <laughs> But that is the point. The heart of God is one that wants to, to rescue and save. So where does this fit with prophetic confrontation? In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul writes this, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, particularly the greater gifts, particularly prophecy. The point of love is that love will confront the beloved. Those of you who have got children here today, 
probably spend time confronting your children. It's not just to get things off your chest, though there might be an element of that sometimes, you know. But prophetic confrontation isn't about getting things off my chest because I'm really annoyed. It's about loving enough so that you want to warn so that people will flourish or be saved or to be rescued. The challenge is it's difficult to confront people who don't want to hear you. And it takes wisdom and sometimes it takes prophetic pictures to know how and how to energise people. So if we go back to the Old Testament again, we, we think about King David. King David was a man who had the power of life and death over his kingdom, didn't he? And he was a hard-hearted man at the stage that we, we pick him up in the story because David has just arranged for one of his best friends to be killed in battle by leaving him exposed to the enemy um, attack um, with, from the city where they're besieging. Withdraw and leave him so he's going to get killed. And he's taken his wife, his best friend's wife, who, he's, who he slept with and has got pregnant, has made a part of his, his own court and taken her to be his own wife. So he's powerful and he's hard-hearted. And there's a prophet called Nathan who God has told to go and confront him. And why does God do that? It's because he loves David and he wants him to turn. And he loves the nation and wants the nation to turn. And so, so, so Nathan goes to confront King David. What does he do? Does he go and say, thus says the Lord, you have sinned? <laughs> no. What he does is he tells them a story. And he helps David see something in his imagination. Part of the prophetic is unlocking the prophetic imagination. And, and Nathan tells David the story. He says, once upon a time, there was a rich man who had flocks and herds of sheep. And there was a poor man who lived nearby who just had one ewe lamb. And he loved that lamb like a baby. He called it Florence. It slept with his children. He didn't call it Florence. That was my interpolation. But he, he loved it like his own child. And there was a time when the rich man had visitors. And instead of killing one of his own sheep to feed the visitors, he went to the poor man and stole and took away from him his, his little baby lamb and killed it and gave it to his feast. And, and, and David is outraged. He said, this, this is awful. This man deserves to die. He must pay back. And Nathan turns and says, you are the man. And at that point, the scales fall from David's eyes. And he realizes he's behaved towards his friend. The way this, this man is, and it's much worse, isn't it? You know? and, and, and that causes David to repent and ultimately saves him and the kingdom. It's the prophetic imagination. It's, this is what you see, and now it's got to be. Here Jeremiah sees, he, and he sees the clay like a life or like a kingdom. Jeremiah himself, from his call, the word of the potter has been powerful to him because when God spoke to him in 1 Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, he's, he says, from before your mother's womb, I shaped you. And the word for shaped in Hebrew is yatsar. And the word for potter is yotzer. It comes from the same root. A potter is someone who shapes. And God's already said to Jeremiah, I've shaped you. I, you, you you've been clay in my hands and I'm making you something for my purposes. And Jeremiah understands what he is. But also God is shaping a nation. And the nation is for his purpose. And the reality is that when God shapes, he shapes a person and he shapes a community for his purpose. And he's God. He's allowed to do that. We should be saying to, to God... You're the potter, I'm the clay. Mould me and make me. This is what I pray, which is an old vineyard song. But we, we should be praying that. We say we, we don't be like resistant clay. Because you can resist the potter's hand. But the potter has every right to knock you down and make something brand new if that's what you do. And this is what Jeremiah sees. And so he's speaking to the nation. And he's saying to them, it's not too late. If you turn from your ways... God will make something beautiful with, your, with, with you as a community, as a people, and restore you. So turn back to God. It's a confrontation that has with it the message of hope. And confrontation should always carry that. Confrontation is not judgment. Conde condem confrontation is not condemnation. Confrontation is not writing you off. A prophetic word of confrontation is to allow you to have a hope and a future. I can remember m myself... Um, a few years ago, somebody from, from this church who cares about me, having had a picture of me in some distress, 
and then praying about it and, and getting the, the word, really, and saying to me, if you continue in this pathway, you're going to find yourself distressed and hurt. And I, I said, thank you very much, and continued in that pathway and got myself distressed and hurt. <laughs> you know? That's, it's foolish to ignore confrontation that's designed to help you to flourish and to call you back to God. So, I wonder if one reason why we don't confront isn't just because it could be abused, isn't just because we want to follow this pathway of grace and mercy, but because we don't love enough to confront. And confrontation takes energy and it takes wisdom. For those of you who are in a marriage where you need to confront, you know, how are we going to say this? For those of you who've got kids, those of you who've got friends, those of you in a workplace where there's a difficult situation, how do you confront? Do you care enough to do it? Do you care enough about the person who's being abused or is abusive? Or the, or, or, or the people that they're affecting? Or the principles that say, do you love enough? Because confrontation should always be empowered by love. And if it is, God will do something with it. There are a number of confrontations in the New Testament. Do you remember when Peter is withdrawing? It says in Galatians, Peter, who has been sent by God really to help um, establish the church and see an amazing church made up of tribes and tongues of all nations and yet he's withdrawn from eating with Gentiles and just with, with Jews and, and Paul says when I came I confronted him face to face he says what you're doing is not right but he did that because Paul loved the, the, the Gentile people and I guess he loved Peter and he wanted to win him and there was enough love there to win that confrontation and Peter did what was right so our challenge is, do we love enough? You know, sometimes I think I don't care enough, so I'm not going to confront, because I, I, it's going to take too much energy. But I need to love more, and then I need to get the wisdom from God to know how to speak so that someone can hear. We need wisdom to know how to speak in a way that people will get the message. And, and the, the prophetic is about giving us words of wisdom and pictures of wisdom so the people that we're called to confront will get it. So do we love people? Do we love our communities? Do we love our small groups and our pastors? Do we love our neighborhood? Do we love the church? Do we love the place at work? Do we love our nation? This week, Justin Welby spoke to our government, didn't he? With others. And I think there's something prophetic about that. How do you love a nation? A nation is a bit difficult to love sometimes. But um, I think when you have a role like the Archbishop of Canterbury, you have a role that gives you a window into the nation and you hear stuff and it gets under your skin and you, you worry about it and you pray about it, I'm sure. And so when Justin Welby spoke into government, he was saying, actually, things are broken and we need to change. It's a prophetic confrontation, a prophetic warning. Did government like it? Not really. The government would like the church to be silent on political matters. The government would like it, okay, you church, you go and have your services, do your charity work, that's great. But don't speak to us about law and government and economics because that's our sphere. But it's not, is it? Jeremiah spoke to government. He spoke to the king. He spoke to the nation. And he loved the nation. They were his people. And he knew that God had a purpose and a hope for the nation. And though it, it talks at the beginning of Jeremiah, you know, to, I'm going to give you words that are going to be about uprooting and tearing down, but also planting and building. There's always the message of hope with the confrontation. It's always there in Jeremiah. It should be there with us. And so um, I, I guess I'm going to finish in a moment. On the subject of prophecy, it's something we want to invest in, actually. This, this afternoon, our prophetic teams are having some input from Liz Evans, who is a prophet, prophetess, and, and she's doing some training with our prophetic teams and looking at um, the different levels of prophecy and, and how it's validated and how we learn to interpret and all that kind of stuff. It's important that we, we learn and try and grow in equipping it. And I, I would love prophecy to have that sharpness, that it's not flaky, it's not abusive, but it brings the word of God 
in a way that releases hope and change in the lives of people. So we want to invest in the prophetic in this season, and we'll be doing it. And we, we don't release people to confront and challenge in this church unless we know stuff about them, that their character and their discernment is, is something that has that weight about it, you know? I, I think the reason what we talk about prophecy being for education, sorry, edification, encouragement, and comfort is because that's level one. We can't do any harm with that. And with ministry, the first rule is first do no harm. And when people kind of, who are not fully mature or, or have got stuff in their character that needs to be resolved or are learning about the gift, kind of download heavy stuff, you know, dates and mates, correction and direction, then that can do damage. But we do want the prophetic to grow so that we've got that capacity for those levels of insight and warning. So stage one prophecy, we say no dates, mates, correction or direction. But where we have prophetic office, actually I believe those things are appropriate. Does that make sense? So stick with us on this journey into prophetic. But, but right now, you know, now I, won't, I won't kind of come up with any spurious prophetic words, but what we do want to do, we're going to go back into worship. And, and we do want to take a chance just to pray for people who today have a need for God's word in their life. And as, as normal, we'll have a ministry team just down on, on my left. And if today you, you need breakthrough in your life, you need healing, you need God to touch you, then do come and get some prayer.